Okay. I am going to start. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is York Lowe. I'm a board member of the Chinese Historical Society of New England, also known as Chesney, and also the chair for of its Tony Lee lecture series and a very exciting new initiative, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in the introduction. But uh, welcome everyone to uh, Coming to America, the life of three Chinese students who stay behind. This is a very exciting talk and we're very honored to have uh, three distinct, uh, distinguished professor uh, who are experts on the three uh, uh, individuals that we will cover uh, today. So um, this is the first event of uh, something called 150 Years of Chinese Students in America Initiative, which we, we have uh, recently started. Uh, and this is really to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the formation of the Chinese Educational Commission, uh, which, uh, which was formed in 1872 that brought over the first 120 students to America. Um, so while, uh, while today's focus will be on CEM, uh, which the mission is known, also known uh, as, uh, the initiative really covers the first uh, century or the first three waves of Chinese students coming to America. Most of them are um, to New England, which uh, so, so for hands very fitting that Chesney is organizing this. Uh, and, and many of these individuals have made significant contributions in, in both uh, Greater China and the US. And, and uh, I think their story is worth, uh, definitely worth uh, studying. Um, and uh, we will follow up with other talks. Uh, but I, I want to highlight to everyone that one of the key components of this initiative is our website. Uh, Chesney.org, uh, where uh, we are showcasing a number of articles and papers related to this topic, kind of a central repository, if you will. So, so for example, we have uh, already two papers on uh, CEM by Professor uh, Ying Yu Yong from Tokyo and also Roger Lee from Shanghai, both of them descendants of uh, CEM students. Uh, and we also have a very interesting paper, some of you might know, uh, that is written by Gary Libby, our friend. Um, from Maine uh, about early Chinese students on Maine. So that those has been uh, loaded, uh, uploaded to the site. Uh, we have received very good response from all different people since we launched the initiative, whether it's descendants or people who are into uh, the topic of Chinese students. Uh, so we, you will also see uh, Professor Chen's paper on Hong Yan Chang on the website. And we also have Professor Xu Guang uh, from UMass Amherst who actually have uh, research on Chen uh, Huan who was the first uh, Chinese graduate of uh, Mass Agricultural College, which is the predecessor of UMass Amherst. Uh, and he also just so happened is the son, was the son-in-law of Liang Chang, who was one of the very, probably one of the most famous CM student who was the, uh, became the Chinese ambassador to the US and also helped launch the Boxer Indemnity Scholar Program, which uh, led to the second wave of students. So um, I would like to thank all the individuals and, and organizations who helped promote this event, uh, including many uh, Chinese historical societies uh, across the country uh, who have promoted, and also many descendants of CEM students who have reached out. Uh, and also, most, uh, more, very importantly, uh, our sponsors, uh, which includes Tufts Medical Center, South Cove Community Health Center, uh, PLUS Charitable Trust, Taitung Pharmacy, the Boston Foundation, and the Margaret Y. Wong Family Fund. Uh, I think one particularly note is uh, the Phi Lambda Charitable uh, uh, Trust, uh, which is the charitable trust arm of Phi Lambda, which is a, a fraternity that was started in 1919 at Columbia University. Uh, and I want to highlight the connection to today's event. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm PL brother myself. And actually, as, as it turns out, uh, one of the late PL brothers, uh, Timothy Gao Zhong Lu, was one of the, probably one of the first person to uh, research this topic of uh, CEM. So uh, it's a, a kind of an interesting connection there. So we will, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, I guess we'll talk, uh, the, today's talk will be basically three talks that is about 15 to 20 minutes each. Uh, so you can save all the questions uh, to the Q&A section uh, at the end and you can type those along the way in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and if you um, uh, would like to make a comment on camera, we had, let us know in the chat and we'll, we'll have uh, Brianna to open up the, uh, your camera uh, later on. Um, so without, I mean, without further, I would like to, uh, to to bring to the main topic today, which is our, our talk. Uh, so the three experts we happen to have a, a law professor, a history professor, and an English professor to talk about uh, the three interesting subjects that we have. Uh, and first, I guess we welcome back Professor Edward Rhodes, uh, who actually we say welcome back because uh, he actually. Um, when he wrote the book Stepping Forth into the World, which is a, you know, one of the definitive book on this topic uh, of CEM uh, in 2011, he actually gave a talk to us in person. Uh, 
so we really welcome him back. He, of course, I think many of you who are uh, in the Chinese studies area know him well. He has written many books on, on Chinese history, uh, a professor at U, uh, University of Texas at, at, in Austin for many years and currently a visiting scholar at, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, and we will have him talk about a little bit about CEM for those who might not be familiar. And uh, of course, the first subject, uh, I guess, Yong Kwai, who is related uh, to Yong Wang, who started CEM, uh, whom you see in the picture here. So Professor Rhodes, without further ado, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you. Um... Thank you very much for inviting me back. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to talk about the Chinese educational mission. Uh, I'm going to make this uh, introduction uh, uh, fairly brief. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the Chinese educational mission or CEM during the 1870s was a project of the Chinese government, which was then the Qing dynasty. The dynasty had just survived two foreign wars, the, the Opium War and the Anglo-French War, uh, as well as a major civil war, the Taiping Rebellion. Finally, realizing the need to modernize, it launched a self-strengthening movement, which ran from about 1870 to 1895. And the Chinese educational mission was one component of the self-strengthening movement. The CEM called for sending 120 young boys to, uh, to America to study for 15 years, after which they would go home to China to help lead the modernization effort. In Chinese, the CEM is known as Yo Tong Chu Yang Yi Ye, or young kids uh, going abroad to study. The idea for the CEM came from Yong Wing, whose image is on, on the screen, who as a, as a teenager in 1847 had been taken by a missionary to the United States to attend Munson Academy in Massachusetts. And from there, he went to Yale, becoming in 1854 the first Chinese to graduate from an American university. Sometime after his return to China, Yong Wing joined the staff of Zheng Guofan, who was then China's most powerful provincial official. To Zheng Guofan, Yong pitched his idea of replicating on a grand scale his own personal experience as a student in America. Zheng was persuaded and eventually in 1871, he together with uh, another powerful provincial official, Li Hongzhang, convinced the Qing court in Beijing to go along with Yong Wing's idea. Yong Wing was sent back to the US to become the associate head of the CEM. The program called for sending 30 boys uh, a year uh, uh, to the US for four years. Uh, from 1872 to 1875. And at the time they were all boys, uh, the boys, then they were all boys were quite young. Most were between 12 and 14 years old. Here's an image of uh, one of either the third or the fourth uh, so-called detachment of boys. There are 30 of them as you, if you count, and they're all very young. They're standing in front of the, China, of the maritime um, the, uh, um, the, the shipping company in Shanghai. This is before they, they, they went uh, to the U.S. There were four, four detachments, and this is either the third or the fourth. Uh, a majority of these kids came from Guangdong province with a smaller number coming from the Shanghai area of Jiangsu and Zhejiang. They were all sent to New England and the American headquarters of the CEM was set up in Hartford, Connecticut. On arrival in the US, the boys were divided up and assigned to American families, usually two to each family, with whom they lived and by whom they were initially homeschooled. The families, uh, incidentally, were, had volunteered for the program and were compensated by the, by the CEM for their effort. In time, the boys were enrolled in uh, regular American schools. And here is an image uh, of uh, uh, Hoyo High School. And uh, there are two Chinese kids there in the lower left-hand corner uh, sitting, uh, if you look carefully. Um, anyway, uh, I, I don't know who they were. A um, number of, of Chinese students did go to high school, so it's not clear who exactly these two kids were. At the same time, they were expected to keep up with their Chinese studies in part by spending time at the CEM headquarters in Hartford. And here you have them doing, uh, doing their Chinese lessons with a Chinese uh, tutor. Um, 
And uh, by 1881, nine years into the program, 43 boys uh, had progressed to college with three of them having graduated from Yale. And here are two of the three. Uh, this is uh, in 1881 at Yale, the Sheffield Scientific School. Uh, and uh, there, one is uh, in the second row on the left uh, from, from the front. And the, uh, the other is uh, uh, about the fourth row back uh, and a little more towards the center. Um, so that was in 1881, nine years into the program. In 1881, however, the Qing government suddenly canceled the program for conservative reasons, for, for, because conservative officials back in China um, uh, had thought that the CEM boys had become too Americanized. And here are the boys uh, in 1882, uh, in, in 1881, uh, just as they're about to be uh, going back to China. These are all Yalies. Uh, and I might add that uh, uh, Zheng Hongyan, um, who, who uh, uh, Jack is gonna talk about, uh, he's in the second row on, on the left, middle row, uh, sort of looking off to his, uh, his right. Uh, one of uh, there's a guy behind him with his hand on. Yep, there he is. Uh, that's Zhang Hongyan. Um, anyway, these were all Yaleys, uh, and you can see that they're all uh, no longer quite looking quite the way they looked when they first came. Aside from the fact that they're they're ten years older, the, uh, the, the the kids had become too Americanized, and so the boys were ordered home. Though obviously disappointed, nearly all of them did as they were told. Two of them, however, defected and five or perhaps six others soon joined their way, soon made their way back to the United States to complete the education that had been interrupted by their, by their recall. Yong Kwai, about whom I'll talk, uh, was one of the two defectors and uh, Zheng Hongyan and Lei Yangfu uh, were among the uh, five or six who came back uh, to America. Okay. So that's the introduction. Let me also make a pitch. My book, you know, Hong Kong University Press. Now, should I proceed or? Uh, yes, please go ahead and proceed okay. to talk about Yong Kwai. All right, Yong Kwai, here we go. Now here, I have to say, I'm not, I don't really know, know much about Yong Kwai. The person who knows the best, the most about Yong Kwai is his grandson, Bruce. Bruce Young, uh, a uh, fellow uh, classmate of mine at Yale, uh, class of 1960, also a, uh, a Texan, uh, uh, and he has done a lot of research on his family, uh, and particularly on his grandfather, Yong Kwai, and he's the, one, he's, he's the one who really should be talking about him, but unfortunately, he's not in the best of health, uh, and, uh, and so I sort of I am substituting for him. Uh, I don't know whether he's on the web. Uh, is he one of the participants? Uh, I don't know if he is. Uh, I hope you will correct uh, any mistakes and, and whatever. So now on to Yong Kwai. Yong Kwai, or Rong Kui, as, he, uh, as, as his name is pronounced in Mandarin, was a member of the second detachment uh, uh, of uh, CEM students that was sent to the US in 1873. He was a native of Guangdong province and came from a low rung scholar official family. He was distantly related to the CEM founder, Yong Wing. Born in 1861, he was 12 years old when he left China. Um, Yong Kuai and the second detachment, which incidentally included uh, Lei Yanfu, uh, had, had an exciting introduction to the United States. On their way from San Francisco to the CEM headquarters in Hartford, their train was derailed and held up in Iowa by, by Jesse James and his gang of robbers. They were not harmed, however. Once in New England, Yong Kwai, along with uh, Le Yanfu, was sent to Springfield, Massachusetts to live with the family of Henry Vail, a medical doctor. And he was homeschooled by Dr. Vail's wife, Sarah, whom he called Grandma Vail. At some point, he enrolled in Springfield High School. It's not clear exactly when he did this, uh, but at some point he, he entered uh, uh, Springfield High School from which he graduated as salutator salutatorian, who was the second ranking student in 1880. Unlike Lianfu, who after a few years left Springfield for New Haven, Yong Kwai stayed in Springfield throughout his tenure with the CEM. While in, high, while in high school, Yong Kwai attended several uh, revival meetings by the famous evangelist Dwight Moody, 
1878, uh, Yong Kwai was converted to Christianity, as were some other CEM students. He and they then formed a Christian missionary society. Each of its members promised that when he had finished his studies and returned home to China, he would, quote, bring my native land under the influence of Christianity, unquote. Yong Kwai was the treasurer, treasurer of the society. Here it should be noted that though Yong Kwai had become a Christian, he had not joined any specific church, nor had he been baptized. This becomes important later on, slightly later on. Yong Kwai's conversion to Christianity greatly upset his father back in China, so much so that once he found out, he literally disowned his son. It also greatly angered the newly appointed head of the CEM, Wu Zidang. According to Yong's retrospective, Yong Kwai's retrospective account, Wu was, quote, shocked at the behavior of the boys who dared to look him in the face and were not inclined to say yes to every word that came out of his mouth, unquote. In early 1880, Wu Zedong summoned Yong Kwai to Hartford and ordered him to recant his conversion to Christianity. When Yong refused, Wu put him under house arrest at the CEM headquarters in Hartford. Wu eventually was persuaded by Joseph Twitcho, the pastor of a congregational church in Hartford and a close friend of Yong Wing, to allow Yong Kwai to return to Springfield to finish out his senior year at the high school, which he did. He graduated in 1880. But very soon afterwards, Wu Zedong expelled Yong and one other Christian convert, a, man, a boy by the name of Tan Yao Xun, from the CEM and ordered them to return to China. This was now a year before the recall of the entire CEM. In July, 1880, as the train taking Jung and Tan to San Francisco stopped at Springfield, both men slipped away. The two of them had defected uh, from the CEM. By so, by so doing, Jung Kwai had lost his scholarship money. However, with financial help from Jung Wing, Joseph Twitcho and their friends, including Mark Twain, Jung was able to attend Yale University from which he graduated in 1884. It was while he was at Yale that he went beyond being a convert to Christianity and was baptized and joined the university's Church of Christ. It was probably also at this time that he shed his cue or the pigtail that the Manchu rulers of China required of all adult males on pain of death. This act, the cutting off of the cue, symbolized the severance of his ties to the Qing dynasty. The financial aid from Yong Wing had come with a couple of conditions. One was that Yong Kwai, quote, would tender his services to the Chinese government when his education was completed, unquote. This, strangely enough, he did, even though he had cut off his queue and presumably was persona non grata with the Chinese government. Thus, for the first year after his graduation from Yale, he served in the Chinese legation in Washington and the Chinese consulate in New York City. They probably found his fluency in English of use. It was also after his graduation from Yale that he wrote an unpublished account of the CEM. The account was dedicated to Mary E. L. Burnham as, quote, a token of warmest, truest, and purest love, unquote. May Burnham was a Springfield girl, seven years his junior, who may have been a friend of Yong Kwai's host family, the Vales. May, May's father, reportedly objected to their marrying. According to Dana Young, quote, a family legend relates that her father would not countenance the idea of their marriage unless Kwai promised to go away and have no contact with May for a period of time, unquote. The nature of his objections is unclear. Was it her youth? Uh, she was seven years younger. Was it, uh, was it his lack of a job? Uh, was it because he was Chinese? We don't know. In any case, Yong Kwai and May Burnham did marry, though not until almost 10 years later, in 1894. And one of those attending the wedding was Yong, Yong Wing. Meanwhile, according to chronology prepared by Dana Young, Yong Kwai seems to have tried his hand at different things. In 1886-87, he took some courses in engineering at Yale and at Columbia, even though his undergraduate program at Yale had been in the humanities. Then in, 1880, then in 1887 to 90, he worked as a freelance reporter in New York City for the New York Sun and the New York Herald. 
And he contributed a few articles in 1889 to our youth magazine on such topics as the Chinese New Year, Chinese food and ancestor worship. Then in 1890 to 93, he rejoined the Chinese diplomatic service in Washington. Then in 1893 to 97, he was once again a reporter in New York City working for the New York Herald. But he also in 1895 founded and or edited an occasional Chinese newspaper, the New York Chinese News or the New Yue Hua Bao. It was while working and living in New York that Yong Kwai and Nate Burnham uh, were married. In 1897, after uh, uh, three years after they married and right after their first son was born, Yong Kwai finally settled down. He re-entered the Chinese diplomatic service working in Washington, this time for good. He started as an interpreter and rose successively to be in 1906, the second secretary, and then in 1904, after the Republican Revolution that overthrew the Qing Dynasty, he became the first secretary. And then in 1933, counselor. He died in Washington in 1943 at the age of 83. May, his wife died in 1952. With but one or two brief exceptions, it appears that Yong Kwai never returned to China. Uh, the major exception was in 1908, when according to Dana Young's chronology, he and his family went to Tianjin and Beijing for about six months. They evidently did not visit his ancestral home in Guangdong. I sort of find this rather strange, uh, but then again, his father had disowned him. Uh, finally, uh, Yong Kwai and May Burnham produced four sons and three daughters. Their children all bore Yong Kwai uh, as their last name. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, Yong Kwai's papers are at Yale. Uh, uh, the manuscript number is 1795 for anybody who wants to pursue this. So, one more. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and I will save the questions. There are lots of questions. Uh, okay. I will save the questions until the very end because I uh, do want to go on with the program. Uh, so next, uh, you know, a great honor also to have uh, Professor uh, Gabriel Jack Chin, uh, who is a law professor at UC Davis. Uh, he is uh, very close to the subject uh, Hong Yan Chang because he actually helped uh, Hong Yan Chang to uh, kind of secure it. He led the effort to advocate to security effort to have him posthumously admitted to the California bar, which happened in 2015. Uh, and I think uh, it's very interesting because I think when we talk about the topic of CEM you know, students, a lot of them uh, for many reasons have to go back to China uh, and they have achieved you know, success, whether you know, railroads or diplomacy or different politics realm and many other realm. Uh, but the, the three the individuals that we picked actually stayed in the U.S., which is kind of of the minority, and and they uh, also achieved great things, but really suffered a lot of discrimination. Because uh, I think the Exclusion Act uh, era, we we you know a lot of the focus has been on excluding Chinese laborers, but I think as a Chinese uh, you know accomplished students also suffered a lot of uh, discrimination uh, in, in becoming a professional. So. So I will pass this to Professor Chin. Uh, so Jack, do you want to go into Hong Yan Cheng? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, I am indeed going to talk about Hong Yan Cheng, who was a participant, as Professor Rhodes has said, in the Chinese educational mission. He is a very interesting and important historical figure, in my view, in part because he was the first Chinese American who was regularly admitted to the bar in the United States. And I'm going to say, with all due respect to Professor Duvall and Professor Rhodes, that my guy has the most prestigious resume of the three gentlemen that we're talking about today. He was 12 when he came to the United States, and he attended uh, Phillips Academy Andover, which many of you in New England will know is the, a place where presidents and senators and Nobelists and Academy Award winners have been educated. He went on as Professor Rhodes said, to Yale, uh, uh, where he spent two years before he was recalled. And he did go home as he was asked, but he wanted to be in the United States. So he returned, came through Hawaii and got to the United States where he enrolled at Columbia Law School. And I understand that when he was there, he was the only Asian student on the whole campus. 
things certainly have changed. He was admitted to Columbia based on an examination that tested his knowledge of Greek and Latin language and history. The tuition, another thing that's changed, was $150 a year. Uh, uh, and he did finish. He did not finish his four years at Yale College, but he finished the program at Columbia Law School. And at the commencement uh, proceedings, the Dean of Columbia talked about him in some detail in a way that we now might regard as coming close to anti-racist. The Dean said, I would like to add a word of special greeting to one of your number who has come here from a far distant land pressed by an irresistible desire to acquire knowledge of the principles of common law. Coming from China by way of the Sandwich Islands, he is among your number tonight, a living and most credible witness to the fact that there is implanted in the mind of man an instinctive desire for justice, that universal justice, which betokens his relations to a great lawgiver, whose aim it is to bring about in the end, not merely national justice, but the sway of natural justice. You cannot have failed to recognize in this stranger a gentleman fit in every respect to be a professional brother to any one of us. In your kindness of treatment and marks of friendly esteem, you show that however narrow and provincial in spirit our international politics may be, a true university knows no disparaging distinctions based on race or religion, but spreads its arms wide to welcome all who resort to it with lofty aims and generous purposes. So I know that you will all join me in a most friendly and respectful parting salutation to our good brother, Mr. Hong Yan Chang. So the reference, of course, to the narrow and provincial spirit of our international politics had to do with the racial oppression of Asians and, and others uh, at the time, which had three aspects which are relevant here. The first, uh, as York mentioned, was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the policy of Chinese and then Asian exclusion was in effect in one way or another until 1965 in this country. Another important legal problem for Hong Yan Chang was the 1790 Naturalization Act, one of the first acts of the first Congress signed by George Washington as president, John Adams as uh, vice president and president of the Senate, Thomas Jefferson as secretary of the state, secretary of state, and the 1790 Naturalization Act restricted naturalization to free white persons. And the racial restriction was in effect in one way or another until 1952. So the inability of non-whites to naturalize was important uh, at the time, much more important than it is now, because New York, like other states, restricted a number of privileges, the right to practice law, medicine, licenses, public employment, land ownership, either to citizens who were actual full US citizens or to migrants who had taken the first step to become a citizen by declaring their intent to become a citizen. Uh, and in order to validly declare your intent to become a citizen, you had to be white. So for a lot of immigrants, this set of restrictions was a technicality because as soon as you landed in the United States, you could go to the courthouse take the oath that you intended to become a citizen, and then you would have a lot of the rights of citizenship. But for Hong Yan Chang and other Asians, that was not a possibility. So Hong Yan Chang dealt with this problem in two ways, which I think reflect his creativity as a lawyer. The first thing he did is that he procured a naturalization certificate from a New York judge. I still have not been able to figure out after some years how he did it. Uh, uh, he was not the only Asian who had a naturalization certificate. A lot of them got them, even though it was completely clear that they were not entitled to be naturalized. There was no debate about that, but some judges did it anyway. Why? Well, it's possible that for some judges, this was civil disobedience to a law that they thought was in unjust. It might also, in some cases, have been political corruption uh, that having to do with political machines and trying to create new voters in some places. And a, a, a final possibility is that some judges thought that a English speaking, Western dressing, Americanized Asian person like the ones that you saw uh, in the photographs, like the ones that we're talking about, these aren't the people who are within the spirit of the law. These aren't the, the non-whites who are excluded. They're for practical purposes white. But in any 
for whatever the reason was, he and a bunch of other people did get a piece of paper that said they were a US citizen. The second thing that he did is he got the New York State Legislature to pass a special law allowing him to take the bar even though he wasn't a US citizen. And, and this to me is also remarkable. How does an immigrant get the New York Legislature to pass a law for him? Well, one of his Yale classmates was the Speaker of the New York Assembly, and he introduced a bill, an act for the relief of Hong Yin Chang, which passed both houses. And so even though he was a non-white uh, at Yale, he still apparently was treated as a human being. He had friends and acquaintances among the, the uh, mainstream uh, class. Uh, it was reported that the governor of New York was doubtful about the bill because it was special legislation. Why, would, why should we do this for one person? But again, uh, he as a double Ivy was in a privileged position and he was able to obtain a meeting with the governor of New York and say, won't you do this for me? I'm a good person. And the governor did not sign the bill but he didn't veto it. So it became law without his signature. And he was able to take and pass the New York bar exam and he was rec recommended for admission. But there was another trick and that is that the law that was passed for his benefit authorized the general term of the New York State Supreme Court to admit him if he passed the bar. It authorized them to waive his alienage, which otherwise was a disability, but it didn't require them to do so. And so the court got his bar application and they saw this law and they said, you know, we could let you in, but we're not going to. Uh, and so he was jammed up. Uh, incidentally, a couple of years later, there was a Canadian lawyer who was in the same situation and the governor of New York signed that bill and the New York uh, Supreme Court general term admitted him. So Hung Yin Chang's denial was, it appears, based on race. But again, uh, reflecting his skill as a lawyer, Hung and Chang recognized that the judges where he was didn't like him. So he did what a good lawyer does. He forum shopped and he went to another New York State Supreme Court, this time the general term in Poughkeepsie and they let him in, in 1888. So he was on the bench. He was unable to practice law for two years after he graduated uh, uh, through no fault of his own. But ultimately, he became the first Chinese American person regularly admitted to the bar in the United States. He then came to California, where he was a clerk in the, law, uh, in the office of the law firm of Chickering and Gregory. Chickering and Gregory was, at the time, perhaps the leading law firm in San Francisco. It was around until the 1990s. And the firm had a number of business dealings, clients who, who uh, 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 were in China, Chinese clients, trade with China. And I think that might have helped get him uh, an introduction there. And in 1890, the head of the firm, William H. Chickering, moved Hong Yan Chang's admission to the California bar on the ground that he was a duly admitted member of the bar of another state. And in a reasonably notorious race decision in 1890, the California Supreme Court unanimously said that he could not be a member of the California bar because he was not a US citizen and could never be one because of his race. So they said, a person of Mongolian nativity is not entitled to naturalization under the laws of the United States and a certificate showing the naturalization of such person by the judgment of any court is void and cannot entitle him to admission to practice as an attorney in this state. Nor who is licensed to practice in all the courts of the state of New York issued by the Supreme Court of that state avail such applicant since only those who are citizens of the United States or who being eligible to become citizens have declared their intention to become such are entitled to be admitted in the Supreme Court of this state on presentation of a license to practice in the highest court of the sister state. So California Supreme Court says, we can tell you're Chinese, you can't be admitted. So. Hung Yan Chang became a banker. He joined the Chinese diplomatic service where he was among other things, the first secretary in charge d'affaires of the Chinese legation in Washington. In 1913, he attended the wedding of Woodrow Wilson's daughter at the White House. And so he had a good career. Ultimately, he was fine. He died in 
Berkeley, California in 1926, uh, 1926 at age 66. Evidently, he did not leave any direct descendants, but he has grandnieces and nephews uh, and, and their children and grandchildren who are still alive. Uh, uh, I find it fascinating. It's a, it's a happy, prosperous family. Uh, a lot of people throughout the Bay Area, including lawyers, including a, a lawyer named Rochelle Chong. And uh, Ms. Chong was the first Asian Pacific American commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. She was the first Asian American commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, so his family has made its way in the law in the United States in a very distinguished way. But Hong Yan Cheng himself was never admitted to practice in California uh, while he was alive. And so my involvement with Hong Yan Cheng started around 10 years ago. I had known about the case. And uh, I'm a professor at the University of California Davis School of Law and the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association with me as a faculty advisor decided to ask the California Supreme Court to revisit the case. And so we prepared a petition to the California Supreme Court, which by this time had, uh, had three or four members of Asian American heritage on it. So things had changed. And we asked the California Supreme Court to posthumously admit Hong Yan Chang as certain other courts have done in situations where historically uh, uh, law school graduates have been denied admission on the basis of their race. And, and the California Supreme Court granted our petition. They wrote an opinion that catalogs the discrimination against Chinese and other Asians starting in the 1850s. And, and they noted that many of the era's discriminatory laws and government actions were upheld by this court. And they said, it's past time to acknowledge that the discriminatory exclusion of Chang from the State Bar of California was a grievous wrong. They symbolically admitted him to the bar in 1915, in 19, uh, 2015. And they said, even if we cannot undo history, we can acknowledge it and in so doing, accord a full measure of recognition to Chang's path-breaking efforts. Uh, in another important, form of symbolic recognition. The Chinese Legal Studies Center at Columbia Law School was named after him in 2021 based on a large, uh, uh, a generous contribution from a Chinese lawyer who had been educated at Columbia. So I think both in the United States and in China, uh, Mr. Chang's important contributions have been recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, and uh, we will definitely have lots of questions coming up. And I also want to add that, you know, Jack is also an expert in all forms of uh, laws that are against Chinese American. He had written a really excellent paper on uh, laws that are again kind of discriminating against Chinese restaurants. And uh, we might bring him back for another uh, talk later on. Um, and I guess last but definitely not least and very interesting uh, is uh, we have Professor Mike Duval from the College of Charleston in South Carolina. And uh, Mike actually comes at this from a different angle because of, uh, I guess, his focus is on American literature. And uh, our last subject, uh, Li Yanfu, Yanfu Li, uh, probably the first Asian to have published a, a book in English in America uh, when I was a boy in China. So, uh, so I'll pass this on to Professor Duval to talk about uh, Li and his uh, interesting work. So, uh, Mike. Well, thank you very much. I hope you guys are seeing the shared screen. One never knows. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I'm just thrilled to be here today. Thank you for the invitation, York, and it's uh, a special pleasure and an honor to be on the panel with Professor Rhodes and Professor Chin. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, Yan Fu Li in, in America. He's one of the students who went back in 1881 uh, with the closure of the Chinese educational mission and then returned. And in, in this case, in 1884, he had been assigned to the Naval Academy at Tianjin and uh, sort of made it over to Hong Kong and worked in a British law firm for a couple of years. 
came over in 1884. I've seen some newspaper evidence that he may have been cleared to come over in 1883, but it was 1884 um, after all. Yes, okay. So he's most, uh, he's best known for his book, When I Was a Boy in China, um, which was published in 1887 by the Lothrop Press of Boston. He is, it is the first book published uh, as, as far as we know by an Asian in the United States or written by an Asian and published in the United States. Here's the cover page, uh, the, the title page and the frontispiece. So you get a look at Yang Fu Li in his Western attire, fully assimilated, his you know, double-breasted uh, coat, high collar, no cue, and with the English signature Yang Fu Li. And he explains in the book that he has changed his name around to rearranged it from Li Yang Fu to uh, Yang Fu Li. And this is the name he sticks with in all the years he's in the United States from 1884 to 1927 for all, all purposes. There are a couple publications of his that he signs W.P. Lee, I think very occasionally to sort of hide his ethnicity and the nationality, but um, always Yan Fu Lee. Uh, here's, a, here's a look at the table of contents, just so you can see what's in this book. It is a book written for children. And in fact, it's not a book written for children. It was a series of articles, which I'll get to in a minute. Written for children, you can see the, the, the subjects, you know, um, this is sort of Chinese life told by a, a person who lived it, you know, um, games, uh, cooking, all of that kind of stuff, religion, school life. And then the last chapters kind of turn toward his entry into the Chinese educational mission and that last, um, last chapter, which um, Professor Rhodes referred to an incident from, is when they arrive in the United States, and it includes this, um, you know, train robbery. So it is autobiographical, I'll say. It's not really an autobiography per se. It's more of what would have been called in the day uh, ethnography and what we would call now autoethnography, which is a form, you know, ethnography is the form of sort of the examination or writing about groups of people from an outside perspective, you know, objectified, categorized, and that kind of thing. And autoethnography is written by a kind of insider, and it has to engage with the um, previous uh, writing about people. So uh, that was just to get you sort of oriented, I guess. When, when uh, Yan Fu Li returns to the United States in 1884, of course, he wants to finish his education at Yale. It had been interrupted. He had one year at Yale before the, uh, the mission closed and he went back to China. Um, and um, so, but when he comes back, he, he surely wants to finish his education, but he also feels that he's on a mission. And I have some newspaper clippings I'll share with you guys. Um, this is from the Buffalo Weekly Express in August, uh, right before he gets back to his classes at Yale. He says he hasn't outlined his future he wants to finish his education, but then he turns pretty quickly and mentions Frederick Douglass. He says, Frederick Douglass has done great good to his people, and it is my ambition to do all I can for China. So I think this is a very interesting identification. You know, he's thinking along the lines of the work that Frederick Douglass uh, is continuing to do in the 19th century, late 19th century, with, with racial uplift and representing African Americans in the seat of power and all of that. Interesting that he, um, that Lee also aligns himself with that. But it's not just, you know, that kind of thing, but specifically he wants to be a writer. So he says, and this is where I got to move Zoom windows out of my way. Um, I desire to follow up a literary career, and I think I can do a great deal of good in this country by simply correcting erroneous American ideas concerning Chinese affairs. And this is kind of a base note of, of his work. Uh, that we're going to see um, in all in all ways. So, with that in mind, you know, you know, he knows he wants to do something in service of the Chinese people, and he knows he wants to be a writer. But how does one become a writer? And if you take Yan Fu Li's example, you take advantage of every opportunity that you are given. And uh, so, I think for me, that kind of starts with his his lecturing. On the left, you see an image from Chautauqua, but a couple lecture notices from uh, Lee's lectures on the right, you know, lecturing in the 19th century, late 19th century too. 
was a way in which you could publish. It was a way in which you could get your ideas out there. You could get an audience's reply and response. You could make some money. Yan Fu Lee says later, you know, at a, in a later interview, like in the 1890s, that he got through Yale by the exercise of his jaws. Surely that wasn't enough, but he made a little money doing this. But I think even more importantly, lectures in the late 19th century would be sort of written up in a newspaper, maybe an abstract, never really a transcript, but pretty substantive accounts of lectures, and then that would enter into the newspaper exchange system so that a lecture, say, that Lee gave in Brooklyn on um, correcting American misunderstandings of Chinese subjects would appear in the Midwest, in the West Coast, you know, in the almost exactly the same as the original uh, story. Also, he made, he took advantage of his, um, his role as, or his opportunities as a student at Yale. And in the Yale Literary Magazine, he published four pieces. I've shared three of them here. These are all Asian focused in one way or another. Talking about recent politics and history in China, um, the romance of tea is kind of a mythological account of the um, emergence of tea and the drinking of tea. Uh, the Light in Asia is his uh, literary critical account or um, review, if you will, of a book by Edwin Arnold, which was entitled The British Writer, The Light of Asia, in which it's you know, sort of a long epic poem written by, from the standpoint of the Buddha. And Lee has much to say about Arnold's approach to that. Uh, believe it or not, he also published, uh, and this is the most amazing thing. You can go to Yale and see this yourself. This is my terrible picture of it. Um, so I apologize for it, but I had to get it all in one view. This is a tremendous, it's like a wall hanging and it's a pedagogical instrument. It's called uh, Lee's Graphic Chart of English Literature, signed Y.P. Lee. And he imagines English literary history uh, as two mountain ranges, you know, one for prose writers across the top and one for poets, and it moves chronologically in, in chunks of 50 years. And the peaks are, you know, the people that he, you know, using the tradition or the understanding of writers at that time, who were the most significant. The bottom row, that middle peak is Shakespeare, and off to the left is Chaucer that kind of thing. And by the way, he sought and got um, sort of feedback from Yale professors, professors at Brown and Harvard on this um, that's reported in a Yale um, student publication. Uh, but what I want to focus on for a little bit is his writing for it for children. He established a contract early on when he came back, probably through contacts of various kinds that he had established earlier and maintained in correspondence when he was in China. So he was contracted to write 12 articles for Wide Awake, the illustrated children's magazine that's on the left there. And that's actually the issue where his article starts. And uh, these 12 articles, uh, monthly articles became the book when I was a boy in China. So 1884 to 1885 is when they were originally published. And then he was also contracted to do a column for something called Chautauqua Young Folks Journal, which was part of the Chautauqua Young Folks Reading Union. Um, it's fascinating what this history is, but for that he managed a column called All the World Round, which the publisher described as an ethnological bureau in which questions would come in from kids and then he would try to answer them. And they would be questions about, you know, kids' lives, you know, kids from foreign lands, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the focus of the stories in Wide Awake and the articles and poems are children from elsewhere, whether it's, uh, you know, other parts of the United States or children abroad and their lives. I, I don't want to neglect that also when he was working for Lothrop, he was involved in a, in a new edition of a book by a British Orientalist um, who was prominent in the day. Lothrop decided he wanted to come out with an American edition of this guy's work and improve it by having an analytical table of contents and, and also uh, have Yan Fu Li look it over. And Lee does look it over. Lee writes uh, footnotes for it. Often the footnotes are what you would expect. Like here's a definition of a term that this guy doesn't give you. Like the guy would, you know, 
he would write in Latin or something, Lee would define it, or he would give some cultural um, information. But on occasion, and there are a couple that I've spotted and looked into, he actually disagrees with the writer. So it's a really interesting case. Um, but I didn't want to neglect to include that. Uh, so this speaks to you know, what Lee is, is doing, his kind of mission to correct misunderstandings and, and how he goes about that. Maybe we'll get a little sense of from this. This is one of the columns from all around the world and it describes all the world round, sorry, I mix that up often. Uh, it describes a case where he, he was at Chautauqua and a little girl approaches him and asks about Chinese food. And the question is noxious, you know, do Chinese really eat this? And then he says, you know, this occasion, um, this was an opportunity, a teaching opportunity. So he writes a lecture to which he attaches this meta discursive statement. Americans are fond of wonderful stories. Nothing pleases them more than to hear something revolting or strange about other people. Nations and races who resemble themselves are not worth attention. Hence travelers, knowing fellows, all of them, possibly find it profitable to startle them with accounts as marvelous as they are false. Not that these accounts are always wholly untrue, but that solitary instances and occurrences are magnified to represent habits and customs of a whole people. And he goes on and sort of prints his lecture, uh, which responds to this question about food, which is kind of a common sinophobic trope really to ask about food. In uh, When I Was a Boy in China, chapter five begins with a paragraph that is not included um, in the, uh, the serial. Um, there's probably some reasons for that. Um, but here it is. It's another similar statement where he starts off by saying that he finds continually still finds false ideas in America concerning Chinese customs, manners, and institutions. He goes on to say, this is not people, the people's blame because where do they get their information? And, um, and he says, through newspapers and accounts of travelers that do not understand what they see in passing through our country. And he mentions Sir John Mandeville. Mandeville wrote a bogus travelogue of China, you know, way back early, but it was influential. And then finally, uh, he sort of wraps that up by saying, accordingly, uh, what I will tell in this series of articles about Chinese customs, manners, and institutions may often contradict general belief. So even within the space of children's writing, he's thinking about how do I counter um, misrepresentation? How do I provide something different? You know, and he feels like he's in a unique position as an authentic subject, you know, who is writing uh, an account of China and Chinese life. So um, I've given you a couple sections from an interview here. This is on the occasion of his graduation from Yale in 1887, in the 1st of July. And he recommits, or he sort of uh, states again, what his mission is. You know, I think people are probably thinking, what, what is he going to do? He could go back to China. Maybe he could. He says, I'm going to stay in the United States and do as much good for my race as I possibly can. And then asked further for his plans, he says he plans to stick around, do a little graduate work in reference to journalism, because he says, I believe that I can do as much for the advancement of my countrymen in that way as any other. And in fact, he does join um, the graduate program at Yale. I don't know how long he stays in it. I think it's only for the first semester. Um, yeah, so, all right, so he is remarkably successful and he's a little bit of a celebrity. There's an Atlanta constitution mention of him as one of the most recognizable or rec well-recognized young men in the United States because of all the press that was coming out. Uh, also at the same time, he was mar uh, uh, married to a white woman and that marriage ended really in a sensationally bad way, which, you know, I'm happy to fill in later. On the left, 1887, September, he publishes Why I Am Not a Heathen, and this speaks to that context of um, conversion to, uh, to Christianity. He's he writes it as a rejoinder to Wang Chenfu, who had written earlier 
uh, an article saying, why am I a heathen? I sort of love that article because it closes with um, that he sort of beckons all Americans to come to Confucius. Uh, and I, to me, that's funny. I don't know if it's funny to y'all or not, but uh, with my background, it's somewhat, somewhat amusing. So, you know, he's demonstrating his assimilation thoroughly. And then in 1889, and these are both North American review pieces, so this is a fairly high status journal. He publishes The Chinese Must Stay, uh, in which he rebuts the logic of Chinese exclusion and the further extensions of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which just kept coming up and coming up every, you know, it needed to be renewed, I think, every 10 years. And so at least every 10 years, it would be renewed and people would try to add even more restrictive um, things. So, but after 1889, really, as far as like being a national voice, a writer that has a national reach, uh, that has all kind of closed for Yan Fu Li. And this is, I'm just gonna compress like 1887 or 1889 to um, 1927 here into a bunch of bullets uh, using Amy Ling, uh, Amy, the late Amy Ling, who wrote a terrific article on Yan Fu Li. She has this phrase that I love that his life is highly peripatetic, meaning, you know, it was like he was moving around and he was moving around literally, you know, so, and, and but also socially just several different things. He's married twice uh, to white women um, and has you know, children from, from both of those marriage uh, marriages. The second marriage, um, he has two, two boys and, uh, you know, and the descendants um, are still here and maybe in the audience. I hope you'll speak up if you want to. Um, He's interested, he's involved in missionary organizations. He's completed, he completed that graduate work, whatever it was at Yale. He says he went to medical school at Vanderbilt. I haven't uh, looked that up or verified that yet. Um, he, there's a legal interpreter, but the thing that sort of most strikes me is in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, he was involved in a very short-lived attempt to open a boarding school for Chinese youth in the United States. Um, but also Chinese youth from China in Kelly's Cove, North Carolina. And it was called the Oriental Academy. It was kind of based on um, uh, the sort of Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee idea uh, and that whole tradition actually of industrial schools. Uh, it lasted one semester and I've been sort of able to find the traces of it in, in newspaper articles, but that's something I'm gonna look into a little more. And he did much other work, uh, including a lot of newspaper work, a lot of work developing expositions um, and all of that. So I just want to do a quick postscript. I know I'm probably pushing my time limit, ask an English professor to talk. That's kind of what happens. Um, okay, in that he desired, and I think this connects right with what Jack was talking about, and Jack knows so much more about it, maybe he'll be able to comment on it. In 1887, when he's graduating from Yale, he says he, he means through a special process, right, a special dispensation to be naturalized. And yet also he loves his native land. So he imagines himself as a citizen of two, of two countries and he doesn't want to give that up. And in fact, this desire, you know, early, as early as 1886, there were reports of him seeking naturalization. And, and there's a Yale student newspaper that gets it wrong and thinks that he actually was successful. He knows he wasn't, obviously. Um, and so fast forward to 1899, I'm sharing with you a resolution of the Delaware Grange, and Granges were uh, agricultural organizations. He was a member of the Delaware Grange, and he um, was a farmer in Delaware. He was a lecturer uh, of the um, Kent County Pomona Grange, as it says here, in this uh, resolution where they resolve to help their worthy brother, Yan Fu Li, who they think will make a fine top type of American citizen, and he would, obviously he was. Um, they are referring to a particular um, special process. Again, I'll consult with the lawyer on this. Uh, in fact, I found that there was a bill pending uh, and I think it went to a committee and just never went anywhere. Uh, so he kept trying this. And here I'm gonna to turn to a kind of sad note. Um, 
This is published in Richard Vale Lee's introduction to his edition of When I Was Boy in China. Uh, I can't get into that story, but I encourage you to find this, uh, the edition of this. He didn't know, Richard, Richard Lee did not know he was the grandson of Yan Fu Lee until he himself was getting married and his father pulled him aside and said, you should know that your father was Chinese uh, because maybe there's going to be a problem with your marriage, given that there were all kinds of miscegenation laws and things anti-miscegenation laws. So he is asked on his way out of the country um, in an interview process in Ellis Island, you know, what, what country are you um, a subject of or a citizen of? And he says, basically, I tried, but I was excluded, right? And then he's like, well, you must be a citizen of, the, of China. And then he says, well, you know, sort of, I presume so, or a citizen of no country at all. And I'll just wrap up with this. So um, taking this from Amy Ling, that Lee wrote and lived on a cross-cultural uh, cross frontier, a psychological and emotional state that is the fluctuating double consciousness of all racial minorities. And you know that's what you find in his writing, I think. On a more hopeful note, maybe, Richard Lee speaks to this of his grandfather and says, Yan Fu Lee's observation that he might be a citizen of no country at all made him a citizen of the world. And uh, so I'm gonna close there. And if you have any questions, um, I'd, I'd love to try to address them. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. So uh, I think, we just in time we have 30 minutes of Q&A which is fantastic and we could go a little longer if we need it uh, this is very interesting topics lots of information uh, but I, I'm going to start with maybe a question of my own uh, and I'll go into some of the audience question and audience feel free to drop your question in the Q&A and, and, and if uh, I did notice that at least uh, one of the CEM descendant uh, Stephen Liang who's the great grandson of Liang Cheng is in the audience and he actually asked a question so we'll get to that uh, very shortly. But I guess one question is, uh, you know, since we talk about the three, uh, I would say all three of them really citizens of the world, they, they, they are very amazing uh, individual. Um, and through your research, I guess it ought to, ought to all the panelists, um, did the three of them actually have any interaction? Uh, I think all three, uh, one, two things I noticed that are in common of two, all three of them came from Heongsan, right, which is now known as Zhongsan, uh, the same uh, area in China. And also, uh, there's all, also the Yale connection, right? So kind of wondering if any come across any kind of, uh, were they any friendship or anything? Or, and I, I guess they are all probably connected to Yong Wing in, in some way also, too, right? That they just get selected into the program. So I don't know if Ed or, or uh, uh, Jack uh, want, to, want to address. I don't have any evidence. Okay. But I would assume that through the through the Yale connection that they knew each other. Oh, I think they uh, they these guys are all hung around uh, with one another, particularly afterwards. I mean, these uh, after they went back to China and mm. uh, they would have uh, annual reunion. I don't know if it's annual, but they have reunions and and things like that. And uh, they also, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, these students when they were in the U.S. as CM boys. They had to go back to Hartford to go to Hartford, uh, particularly in the summertime, to for their Chinese lessons, and mm -hmm. they would also then obviously uh, associate with one another. They also had extracurricular activities, such as there was that baseball team that, mm -hmm. uh, of the of the C uh, composed of CEM boys in Hartford uh, that uh, included uh, boys from different uh, detachments. So I. Uh, they they knew one another certainly when they were there, uh, and uh, and I think they tried to keep it up uh, those relationships afterwards as well. Uh, yeah, Mike, any what, any observation? From your yeah, I think what Jack was talking about with the kind of networking that was possible if you were a graduate of a school like Yale, and I think you know that sort of plays in. I know that Yan Fu Lee in 1890, 1889 to 1890 was working at a bank in San Francisco, mm -hmm. you know, and particularly, you know, that did Chinese uh, business. Um, and it is said in some newspaper mentioned somewhere in the thousand I've looked at, mm -hmm. uh, that he landed that job as part of a connection. And I wonder if he knew 
you know, about the attempts of, um, of Jack's subject to, you know, mm. get the, you know, a sort of citizenship or not citizenship, but access to the bar, you know, there might've been, they might've been communicating about this kind of mm. thing. And of yeah, course, I, I, I find it interesting that um, uh, Hong Yan Chang, uh, uh, I, I look, he became the comp, sort of a comprador of uh, of the Yokohama Species Bank in San Francisco. And the interesting thing about all these, because uh, my my interest is a little bit more in the business history, and and many of the compradors, right, which are kind of middle middlemen or agents for for foreign companies in China, and uh, came from Hong San, right. So there's a large network of people who are from Hong San who are serving as kind of commercial middlemen. And it's, I wonder if that's how. Hong Yan got his position, uh, but that certainly is, a, of course, of course, his knowledge also very important too. So, um, so Can yeah, I, I think jump in for a second and just sure. to correct, uh, uh, Kui, uh, uh Yong Kui uh, was not from uh, Hong San. He was from uh, oh. Sun Bui. Sun Bui, okay. Yeah, um, uh, good to uh, know. And yep. a uh, nearby county. Nearby, nearby. Yes. Um, good. Um, so I guess, uh, I will go into uh, Stephen's question, Stephen Liang, who's the great grandson of Liang Cheng. And I guess he was asking, uh, what year was uh, Hong Yan Cheng in the Chinese diplomatic service? And uh, did he surf with Yong Kui and uh, I guess his great grandfather Liang Cheng? Um, so the research that we did and Family members may have more accurate information, but the research that we did says, suggests that he worked for the Chinese consulate from 1888 to 1895. Uh, uh, from 1895 to 1907, he worked for the Yokohama Specie Bank. Um, he had some positions in China um, uh, and he came back to the US in um, 1908. Um, 1908 to 1910, he was in Washington. 1910 to 1913, he was in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, 1913 to 1915, back in DC. Uh, 1916 to 1917, director of Chinese mm -hmm. naval students at Berkeley. Uh, and then he retired shortly after that. Uh, Yong Kui and uh, Liang Cheng would certainly have been together because uh, Liang was the uh, was the, the minister or the ambassador, uh, and uh, and the uh, and Yong Kui was working in the legation uh, as I don't know first secretary, second 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 secretary, working under uh, the min uh, under the ambassador. Okay, and uh, I guess another question that was just brought, came up from one of the audience is the, the obviously the Yale connection. Uh, so how come a lot of these students went to Yale and, uh, and not say Harvard? <laughs> I guess we may have to do something to Young Wing or the proximity of the. It absolutely program. has to do with Young Wing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was the Young Wing connection. Most of the, 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 the most of the a. Uh, most of the students who went to college, uh, a majority of them went to Yale. But, you know, I think two or three did go to Harvard. Hmm. MIT is a big, uh, large number. Yep, and, and, and yeah, definitely uh, for those interested, uh, uh, Professor Emma Tang is also an advisor to this initiative and uh, hmm. I helped work for her on this China Comes to MIT website, uh, which has a lot of information on those folks who are, uh, went mm -hmm. to MIT from the ZM. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one of the question from Ben Relton uh, on the, uh, is regarding the closure of the ZM program. I guess the Qing government definitely closed it, but were there, was it also kind of a result of the, the exclusion error prejudice, uh, you know, and the US government to a certain degree that they want to close it. And it kind of some, drawing some parallels to today, right? There's also some, some US uh, sensitivity uh, or, against Chinese students or Chinese uh, uh, academics uh, in general. Should I jump in Ed, here? Yeah, Ed, go ahead. Yes, uh, please. <laughs> there's there's uh, a, uh, some basis for that, uh, that point of view. Uh, 
from the very beginning, the, the Chinese authorities uh, intended really for, for the students to uh, come, go back to China, you know, and help with uh, strengthening China. And uh, this meant in part uh, going to uh, attending military schools and naval schools. Uh, However, uh, it is interesting that uh, among all the American colleges and universities that the uh, CEM students attended, none of them went to Annapolis or uh, West Point. And this is not because they didn't try. Uh, Yong Wing uh, brought this up uh, with uh, various uh, top American officials, including ex-president uh, U.S. Grant. Um, uh, but, uh, and also it is interesting that, uh, that actually Japan or the Jap there, there were Japanese students at the Naval Academy at a time when the Chinese were hoping to get some of their students uh, into Annapolis. Um, uh, so you could argue, but the Chinese were not able to do this. Uh, and the one reason for that is that the, uh, the Japanese had been able to get congressional approval for the, their students to go to Annapolis, whereas uh, given the uh, climate of opinion, uh, the, uh, the Chinese were not able to get uh, uh, congressional approval to, to admit uh, Chinese students to, uh, West, to Annapolis. And presumably this, is, this would apply to West Point as well. Uh, so as a result, actually, the Chinese uh, government did send students abroad uh, to study uh, military and naval affairs, but they sent them to Europe. Uh, they they, they huh. sent them the naval students to, to Britain, and they sent the military students to Germany. This is in the 1880s. Yeah. So Professor Duval mentioned that there were constant refinements and amendments and additions to the Chinese Exclusion Act and to other Asian exclusion laws. And, and with respect to this question, you know, throughout the whole exclusion period, there was protection, there was an opportunity for admission for merchants, mm. for teachers and scholars and students. And as far as I know, that door was never completely slammed shut. Mm. Uh, and that's why uh, our, our, uh, our students were able to come back even after the Chinese Exclusion Act was in effect. But uh, Professor Duval is right, that, that over time, these loopholes, these opportunities became more and more constrained. Uh, so I believe, for example, that at first, if you came in as a student or a merchant, you're in. You're right. you know, what we would now call a lawful permanent resident. You can, you can stay. Uh, but at one point, the law changed and you had to maintain that status. And if you lost that status, for example, by graduating from college or something, then you got to go, uh, and you're no longer uh, eligible to live in the United States unless you can find some other status that allows you to be here. Um, um, so I, I think the, the Professor Duval's general point that this area of law was looked at, you know, very scrupulously to make sure that people couldn't, you know, only a very very small number of people could get in. That's true. Okay. And I guess uh, one question for myself is I think the factors that kind of drive the three subjects that we have to stay here, um, could marriage be, be part of the, the reason? Because I, I, I mean, they did marry, the, two of them did marry the American white women, and then one, I believe, Chinese American, Yan married a Chinese American. Would that factor into their, the reason why they stayed in America? Well, I think in the case of Yong Kwai, I mean, I don't know, yeah. uh, but uh, he, he already knew uh, his yeah. future wife uh, and mm. um, how close a relationship he had with her at that time before, at the time that he, uh, that he defected, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, but if it was already a, uh, if they were already uh, a couple, uh, I, that, that definitely would um, would uh, f figure in his decision to defect. Uh. But also, too, you know, if, if in fact his father had uh, had def had disowned him, hmm. uh, 
that there was no home to go back to. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting, as I said, that he did go, he and his family did go back to China for not, not for a very long time, uh, it was six months, and then go back to their ancestral village, let's say, which I found quite interesting. Um, Okay, and uh, we have another question from a descendant. We have Lonnie Lin, who is descendant of Lin Lun Hui, Fai, Lam Lun Fai, uh, uh, who went back and became, I guess, a physician. And he was the head of the, uh, or the principal of the Imperial Medical School. And he was a physician to Li Hongzhang, uh, a very high ranking official. And, um, and I, I guess he also asked a question to myself, which is why we focus on the, f uh, so the first three waves is actually not referring to CEM, it's actually uh, first three waves of Chinese students in general, namely CEM being the first wave, second wave uh, being the boxer indemnity, and then the third wave of students uh, who came after World War II. So, uh, so yeah, sorry, because the, the CEM students did come in waves also. So, so, uh, so maybe a little bit confusing there. So I just want to clarify a little bit. I guess the second question, um, uh, I guess addressing to Dr. Rhodes, I guess Dr. Rhodes mentioned the famous picture of the young boys being in, in Shanghai from the third and fourth wave, right? I get the very famous picture you have. How did we know that? Uh, just He's just curious. Uh, good question. Um, the second de detachment, uh, only had 28 students. That picture had 30. Uh, the, the reason why that's uh, because two of the members of that detachment were already in the US. And so they, they wouldn't have been in the group picture taken in Shanghai. That's one reason. And then the other, I think, had to do, with, so it, may, it wouldn't be the second. Um, hmm. There were only four. Uh, and I think the first one is ruled out because the, the, the picture was taken in front of the, I want to say the maritime, uh, the, the, the steamship company, the, the, the China Merchant Steamship Company. There's a big plaque mm. uh, uh, that- uh, uh, Jiu Shang Gong, right, that one, yes. The Jiao Shang, Jiao Shang, Jiao Shang, Hui, Jiao Shang yep. Jiao Shang, Jiu, Jiu. Jiao Shang, Jiu. yeah. Um, anyway, and that, company was not founded in 1872, I think. Mm. Um, I think that's the reason for ruling that. Ruling that out. Uh, and probably we could, uh, I, I never tried it. I mean, by looking at some of the, uh, looking at details of those young boys, maybe you can figure out, you know, whether it's the third or the fourth, but I haven't done, I haven't okay. done that. Yeah. And I guess another, uh, so another, uh, next question is uh, from Connie Wong. Uh, so question about how did, two of these gentlemen able to were able to marry white women. Wasn't there a ban on interracial marriage until the Loving versus Virginia case overturned that uh, much later? So I don't know if Jack wants to answer that one. It, it varied by state right, and right. places like New York and Connecticut, hmm. really most of New England. Uh, now, I'm sure that they had social prejudices against various sorts of interracial marriage, but hmm. they didn't make them illegal, void, uh, absolutely prohibited, et cetera. Yeah, I Young think Wing I, had, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, uh, Young Wing uh, married uh, a white woman. Yeah, yeah you know, and uh, Yan Fu Lee was married by the same person, the Reverend Joe Twitchell, who was mm. this close friend of Mark Twain's mm. um, in Hartford. <laughs> um, and I think also, you know, uh, so it was acceptable in, in that area and maybe largely in the Northeast and on the East Coast. But, you know, the announcements of Yan Fu Li's intention to marry um, Elizabeth Ma Jerome, uh, who was always, you know, in the newspaper articles, it's always like she's a new Haven heiress, you know, and they like mention the money that she stands to inherit. Um, so you can have the same exact article. It's really interesting because it's on the newspaper exchange. Uh, on the East Coast that just sort of says, this guy is marrying this person, you know, and there's not really much comment on it. Same exact article appears elsewhere, and it has different headlines, because that's kind of the way the newspapers work. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, one I was working with recently, uh, the headline for the same thing, which is innocuous, but the headline says, you know, shades of D. Kearney, uh, Dennis Kearney, you know, the Sandlot, um, guy who's behind this sort of Chinese must go slogan. And then uh, another headline says abominable miscegenation. 
So it does vary from place to place, um, I think, in terms of the law, but also in terms of the attitudes. But there's also a way, um, there's a book by Emma Tang, I pulled it up on my mm -hmm. other screen over here, called yep. Eurasian Mixed Identities in the United States. And, and she talks about Young Wing's marriage and Young Fu Lee's marriage as part of also this kind of a, a way in which you could sort of get, uh, you know, it would be assimilationist. It would be a way to get this kind of um, cachet in a way. So I think that the motivations to get married are probably always mixed, but they're, you know, not simply love, but also it's complex, you know, what's the reputation of a person who is married and, you know, so anyway, that's just a few more colorations to that. Okay. So we still got a good number of questions. I hope everybody is able to stay a little bit longer so we can in case answer everything. Uh, one question that just came up is how were the young boys chosen to study in the US? I don't know if uh, Ed, do you want to cover this one? Good question. Don't know the answer. They, uh, they, um... They had, I mean, they, they were uh, subject to sort of a background check. Uh, the boys were sent to, uh, they came from uh, Guangdong, most of them came from Guangdong province, but uh, prior, but then they were sent to Shanghai uh, where there was a school set up uh, for the purpose really of preparing these kids uh, to, to go to the US. And then they left from Shanghai to San Francisco. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so I think there may have been some screening process uh, involved here. I might add that uh, the, the uh, you know the scholarly the the, uh, the the elite of Chinese society at this time this is the late nineteenth century mm -hmm. were the Confucian educated uh, scholar officials uh, and uh, and. Uh, this project would not particularly appeal uh, to uh, 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 kids in, the, in that uh, the, the, that kind of social background, because they would be they would not be studying Confucian classics. They would not be preparing for the civil service examinations, which is the way to get ahead in China at this time. And so the, uh, I think the government had difficulty uh, uh, recruiting people for, you might think that this would be a great project, you know, that everybody would be applying to go to the US. But in fact, I think they had great difficulty in trying to attract people uh, uh, to get into this program. Uh, and as a result, really, the uh, many of the families that uh, that uh, whose whose kids uh, applied for this program actually were sort of merchant families. Mm -hmm. Many of them sort of involved in uh, international trade. I did uh, mention that Yong Kwai, in some sense, was a little unusual in that her his family seems to have been of the scholar official class except that there was sort of low ranking, they were not high ranking. His father was a government official, but a very low ranking government official. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but beyond that, how they were selected, maybe because of their, 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 their you know, they, they were supposed to study uh, English already, get a little introduced to English. And, you know, maybe uh, those who did well were selected and those who did not do well were not. Um, mm -hmm. so. So I'm going to combine two questions here. I think that from two different individuals, but I think it's about to be essentially the similar uh, topic. Uh, I guess, was there a female equivalent of the CEM program? Uh, and who were some of the first Chinese uh, female students in, in America? I think she mentioned about Mabel Lee. Uh, I think she came much later. Uh, I believe yeah. the first group probably came in the 1880s. Uh, I don't know if anyone want to add some more uh, color. Uh, there, there, there was no female uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, counterpart. Uh, I don't know. I think there were uh, mm -hmm. the, the ones who who came in the eighteen the women who came. I think they came were uh, were private. Those were uh, private. Uh, um, that, yep. that was not a government uh, program. Yeah, but I I, I don't know the. the Beyond that, I don't right. know. Yeah, I, I, I think based on my little bit of research, I think one of the earliest is uh, Yame King, uh, Jin Yame, who was uh, mm -hmm. uh, the first woman to graduate from a child medical school and in, in uh, Chinese student. In, in, I believe she graduated in 1888 uh, from New York. Uh, and, uh, and most of these, and, and some of the few early Wellesley graduates too, also from the 1800s, they were either, um, for example, I think Kinyame was the adopted daughter, uh, daughter of a missionary 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then the the Wellesley graduates were uh, also ch uh, daughters of, of minister, Chinese ministers. So there's a lot of connection. Right? Of course, everybody knows about the Song sisters who also uh, have that religious connection. Um, so, and then I think the formal program is probably not until later. Um, I think the University of Michigan has the Barber, Barber Scholar program that a lot of, of Chinese women over to. Um, anyone else want to add to, to this topic or? I only add a little bit, but according to YC Wang's um, mm -hmm. book, there were four female students between 1881 and 1892, and all four got medical degrees and they're all sponsored by American missionaries. Yeah, so I think Yame is, is one of them. Uh, and, yep. And uh, I guess, okay, another descendant, Debbie Jiang, uh, has uh, raised a question. Um, was Yong Wing influenced by Maury's program in sending Japanese girls and boys to study in New England? What program? I'm sorry. Uh, Maury, I guess a Japanese. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maury, uh, Audi Nori. Yep. Um, let's see, influenced. I don't think it was influenced. Uh, the Japanese had a, a similar program of sending uh, young, uh, relatively young, younger uh, kids uh, uh, or young men to the uh, United States to study and, and also to Europe, actually. But they, uh, they were usually low older. Uh, one of the things, the distinctive things about the uh, CEM is how young these kids were. And the Japanese, when they sent uh, their students, uh, they, they, were they, they tended to be late teenagers rather than early, not even preteen, tweens, really. Um, so they were here in the US at the same time, uh, but I don't think Yung Wing was influenced by, uh, or, uh, by that program. Okay, thank you. And uh, I noticed that uh... and they also did not stay as long too. I mean, fifty. I mean, the other thing is that you know these Chinese students were supposed to be here for fifteen years. Uh, that's yep. a very long time. Yep. And I noticed that Xiao Li also mentioned he wrote a paper. Uh, Xiao Li is someone whom I got to know uh, after we announced the program, and she is very involved in, uh, uh, I guess, a website for early Chinese students at Andover. So I think we do have a few folks from, from Andover here too. And, uh, and she, uh, Xiao's, one of Xiao's uh, research subject is on a Yame Kin. So, um, and I guess, uh, okay, we have four more questions. I guess one is uh, Lee's from anonymous attendee. Lee says his citizenship was stymied by an amendment in the Exclusion Act, but wouldn't the 1790 Act make any further legislation unnecessary? So I guess legal expert, Jack. Kid. So there was a little dispute about whether Chinese or Japanese were white, but this, but, but I, I, when it got to the higher courts, there was really no question. Uh, there was also this weird little period where based on an amendment in the law, the, the free white person part was accidentally dropped. And so there was a period of time in 1874 and 1875 where that part had been omitted from the law. And so you, anyone, regardless of race, could get naturalized then. And then Congress fixed it. Uh, and then, you know, with regard to Chinese, there, were, there was an additional prohibition that was put in the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, in addition to the white requirement that said no person of Chinese ancestry can be naturalized. But I regard that as duplicative. Um, it was, it was, you know, as often happens in the law, there's more than one prohibition on something that, that the Congress or other legislature wants to prohibit. So um, um, put it another way, uh, even though there was some uncertainty about whether Chinese were white, there is no court decision that I'm aware of after 1790 that says the Chinese are white. There were some legal scholars who said, maybe they're white, maybe they're not white. Uh, but, but every court that actually had to, to decide the question said, uh, at least in a, uh, uh, in a published opinion, said not white. Okay. And On the I other guess, uh, hand, actually, there are yeah. actually a fair number of Chinese who, uh, who, who, who were naturalized uh, 
before 1882, including Jung Wing. I mean, Jung Wing was a naturalized citizen, uh, although I think that later on in maybe 1902, the citizenship may have been uh, canceled. Uh, but uh, the uh, so, but there there are actually a fair number of uh, Chinese um, who managed to become naturalized. Um, uh, so Wong Chen Pu among them, actually. That, yeah, and so this this was a thing, but when you went to court and tried to say, "Hey, I'm naturalized. Give me the privileges of being a naturalized citizen," the court would say, "We're not going to do that." Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, and so that that was uh, that was the problem. Yeah. Okay, and I guess Mike, you uh, would like to answer Kathy Huang's, and Kathy Huang is another oh, researcher yeah. who's very active. Well, hi, uh, Kathy. And and uh, <laughs> you, would you like to answer her his uh, her question about? Uh, it's, it was more it was more a comment, but you you feel free to comment. More, <laughs> right. more about why don't why don't you finish that article you've been writing for years? And in fact, I'm stuck on the conclusion right now. It's on my other monitor. <laughs> um, and uh, to submit it, yeah, put it into the evidence, I suppose, for this uh, meeting or whatever. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Okay, and then uh, I guess someone just asked, you know, where can we find the right? It's a, unclear exactly which writings. Uh, we will try to put all the writings and sources, articles, and stuff written by the actual uh, students or other into the, the website mm -hmm. also. Uh, okay, and then Debbie just added some more comment about the Japanese uh, program, uh, uh, interesting book called Daughters of the Samurai, which is interesting. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, and I guess another question that we have is uh, actually for Jack, which is slightly off topic, but uh, what kind of prompted you to kind of research into these anti-Chinese, uh, anti-restaurant uh, legislations, if you will? Um, so, I mean, I think it's not irrelevant to the social and legal situation that our subjects experienced when they lived in the United States. I mean, there was some opportunity for them to work and particularly in the East and, you know, they had some social interactions and some respect from their classmates, but there was also this sort of systematically across the board, you know, in addition to all the things that were happening to the Indians, in addition to all the things that were happening to African-Americans, uh, there was a network of laws that tried to preserve economic opportunity and other things for white people. And, you know, in the West, this was designed to encourage white migration, uh, citizen and uh, immigrant. And, uh, you know, people may remember some of the things that were done to the Chinese laundries in California and licensing, Nick Will versus Hopkins. Uh, and I did a paper on Chinese restaurants that that sort of covers some of the same ground and there were a wide range of legal restrictions and methods that were designed to impair the op the ability of chinese restaurants to operate uh, i have another paper coming out that has to do with asian sailors and fishers and the same sort of thing um, um, and now that more and more of these historical materials are, are becoming available online where I don't have to leave my chair to, uh, to look at them. Um, um, it, it, you know, I see more and more forms of regulation against Chinese and other Asian people um, and, and other non-whites. But basically, you know, so I became interested in, in Hung Yen Chang because there was this 1890 decision of the California Supreme Court that was mm. pretty well known, but you know, it's like, what does it mean? What is the context of it? And, uh, uh, and there's a similar opinion of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court from 1911 that, that basically says that, that a proposed law that pro would prohibit white women from, uh, from working in Chinese restaurants would be unconstitutional. And I saw, I've known about this decision for years, but I, I had no idea what it meant. I mean, what, who could possibly want to prevent white women from eating or working in Chinese restaurants? And once I started researching it, I found law after law, newspaper article after newspaper article that showed that, that this was a movement, uh, uh, which was part of this broader movement uh, to say, 
you know, America is not for Chinese or other Asians. America is for whites. And if we allow mm -hmm. uh, Chinese to have these positions, then they will, they will compete with white workers and that's bad. Okay, thank you. So I believe we have answered all the questions. So I uh, would first of all, thank all the panelists for spending the time and the wonderful presentation and all your work in this area. Uh, I want to once again, draw everybody's attention to, to the website. And if you are in the attendees and you know, um, you are a, either a descendant or you know uh, uh, some of the older folks who are able to you know, give us uh, kind of oral history interviews, uh, we would love to kind of document uh, the, the history of Chinese students uh, in America. And uh, so, I mean, I will uh, pass this on to Brianna Allen, now Executive Director, to talk about uh, other future programs that we have. Uh, Brianna, do you want to talk about some of the other future programs? Sure. Um, first off, I'll just start by saying, um, make sure you get Professor Rhodes' book that he showed us earlier. Um, yep. <laughs> yes. Fourth, fourth World Into the World. Sorry, I can't read right now. Um, and of course, on behalf of Chisney, I would like to say thank you to our panelists um, for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. And of course, our sponsors who are listed behind me on that side, um, who allow us to provide our programming virtually and freely. And of course, everyone here in attendance today who have made obviously events like this possible. Um, this is our 30th anniversary, Chisney's 30th anniversary. So in the upcoming months, we actually have uh, several new events planned. Um, the next one will probably be our next lecture series. We're finalizing the date on that. So that will be another Zoom meeting like this. And then we will have an outdoor exhibit entitled Endurance Streets, Resilience and Response in Boston's Chinese Community, which was um, made possible by a Tish uh, grant. And that will be um, featuring Tunney F. Lee's um, archive, among other items in our collection. Um, both of these will happen in the summer, though. And we will have more information coming soon. And we, of course, hope to see all of you there. And after this meeting, you're going to be directed to fill out a survey. And you'll also get a reminder tomorrow. Uh, feel free to answer any questions that you want to or not and skip any that you don't want to. But it just helps us figure out you know, future programming that might actually interest you. And thank you once again. Um, have a lovely morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be in the world. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. It was a terrific afternoon Hello. afternoon here on the East Coast. Perfect. <laughs> Do you want to stay on, Mike, and I'll talk about oh. private laws? Yeah, if you want. <laughs> if you can we stop the recording? Time. Yeah, I can stop the recording. If you don't mind, yeah. <laughs> we don't want this on the record.